All right, David Guzman inside the NBC4 i Digital Center. We are joined by one of my great friends, a fellow of Syracuse Orange, but also a voice you might hear during this summer's coverage of the Olympics, particularly if you are watching table tennis. His name is Chris Lewis, and Chris is joining us a couple weeks out from the Paris Olympics. Chris, uh, how are we doing in the preparations? Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's going. <laughs> like, that's the thing about it is, you know, you're always trying to find the last piece of information or scramble for the last note or nugget. And, you know, the closer you get, the more you feel like, uh, all right, it's here, it's arriving. So um, I'm excited for it. And the preparation is nonstop. It's your second Olympics doing table tennis. Uh, your first was in Tokyo. Um, how did you end up becoming the voice of table tennis for NBC? Um, the short story is they called and asked, hey, are you available and open to do table tennis? Um, I remember they called me about, I guess, four months before the Olympics uh, in 2021 for uh, those Tokyo games. But a uh, long story is more just going back and forth with people at NBC, just, you know, sending my reel out, asking for feedback, you know, the thing that broadcasters do to try to get better. And, um, you know, one of the things that they told me to work on or they mentioned was, you know, continuing to diversify the amount of sports you do. And I think the fact that at Boise State, when I was working there, I had called a, a plethora of different sports uh, within that athletic department. Um, so I had experience diving into sports that I wasn't necessarily familiar with going in. So um, I think that kind of helped. And uh, when they made the call, I absolutely said yes. Uh, so for everyone who doesn't know, you're actually calling these matches from a booth in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, that's going to be the same for you in Paris. Um, what did you learn from your first experience in Tokyo, which obviously was a very different Olympics by many regards, but um, obviously a lot of learning from uh, your end, right? Yeah, uh, it was number one. What I remember the most was this was in you know the bounce back from COVID, right? So um, just all the restrictions, uh, all the different rules and regulations about it, which was important to keep us all safe uh, at the time. So uh, that was that was probably priority number one. But just remembering how much of a machine that NBC is and how they really know how to turn in the, the product and produce the content uh, from all their announce booths in Stanford to the cafeteria to provide everybody food, right? Because you can't have a bunch of hungry broadcasters with their stomach growling as, they, uh, as they're trying to call these games to uh, you know, the people behind the scenes. It really is a machine. They have it down to a science and you just feel like a very, very small cog in the uh, whole grand operation that they have going on. Yep, yeah, I've heard the food, it, by the way, is very good at the NBC commissary. <laughs> um, so as you're preparing for Paris, um, before we get into the actual table tennis competition, how do you as a broadcaster prepare to call some of these matches, especially for a sport that A, not a lot of Americans are very familiar with, and mm. B, we're not really familiar with a lot of the athletes that are competing either? Yeah, and I almost think having that perspective helps me too, because I, I'm almost more like, the audience than I am the expert within it because, you know, I'm learning about these guys as well. And these fantastic men and women who are dedicating their lives to this sport. So as I'm learning sort of their backgrounds and where they came from now, I'm in a better position to sort of explain uh, to people who haven't followed this sport uh, within these four years between Olympics, uh, what, who they are, what they do. Um, so number one, like how you prepare is know the rules, uh, know um, how, how you win, how you lose, right? Um, how you get a point, um, what they play to. So being able to explain the rules, number one, I think is priority. Um, and then I have a prep document that's like over 200 pages of every single uh, table tennis athlete, whether it's in the singles competition or the team competition, uh, who will go out there. So Going into each day of matches, we're not exactly sure which ones we're going to do. So already having the background of every person who I could do. So now I can just like copy and paste it to a notepad and have those notes in front of me at five minutes notice, right? I don't have to have, uh, you know, hours of prep uh, ahead of it because I've already done the hours of prep heading into the Olympic Games. 
Well, Chris, as you and I both know, it's all about storytelling, as we learned mm. from uh, the Newhouse School of uh, Communications. Uh, so what are some of the main storylines to follow in this year's table tennis competition? And are there any Americans that we should be watching out for? Yeah, um, interesting story. Kanuk Ja is an American who, when he is able to compete, is I mean, not exactly at the level of, you know, the best Chinese players, because like that's almost a whole different standard of excellence. Um, like one of the stories going into every Olympic Games, it seems, especially the last few cycles is, is China going to sweep gold in every uh, every one of the competitions, whether it's singles for men, singles for women, uh, team for men, team for women and mixed doubles, which is the uh, the fifth one, which was added in in the Olympics in Tokyo. So that will be the second one coming up this year. But um, whether they can win gold and silver in the uh, individual awards, too. So uh, China's a different standard. So when it comes to Kanak Ja, who I mentioned on the men's side, um, he's somebody who has had great results against some of the top players uh, in the world. Now, he also, within this most recent cycle since the last Olympics, has had to take a break from the sport. Um, so how he recovered bouncing back is a storyline to follow because when he's right, he's really good. Now, what level is he at come these Olympics in Paris? That's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So why I'm really getting is we have someone to watch, but also look for the Chinese to basically dominate. But the reason why we watch sports yeah. is there might be someone who might be able to take down the Chinese. You never know. <laughs> that was one of the, I, I think, highlights really of any sport of the Tokyo Games was that in mixed doubles, China did not win gold. They were upset in the gold medal match by Japan. Uh, Mima Ito, Jun Satani, they uh, put together the match of their lives to uh, beat China in the gold medal match on their home soil. The only thing that was missing was the crowd going nuts behind it because yeah. we couldn't have any fans in attendance. Yeah. So uh, France does have, uh, you know, capable players in their own right. They have a young, uh, a young prodigy, if you will, who is expected to contend in LeBron. So I always say like, you know, there was LeBron in the United States for basketball, who was a right. you know teenage prodigy. Well, there's a LeBron in France and table tennis who uh, might do some damage in these games. Yeah, that's going to be a really good nugget for uh, for fans to follow. And, and great to see that there's going to be a, a home favorite for, for France yeah. there. A couple more on the broadcasting side. How much do you rely on the analyst and and what is that dynamic like during a broadcast when you're the one picking up the action but you have the analyst who's able to kind of you know obviously add some color but also add some of the explanation that we're going to need to really watch this effectively uh the answer to that is heavily um you know he's somebody who is an olympian competed for the united states team sean o'neill and has now been a broadcaster for I, I want to say at least four uh, of the Olympic games, the last four. So he's experienced, knowledgeable, is really passionate about the sport, really involved in the sport. So um, <laughs> the funny thing is, it's like whatever he has to say, generally much more important than whatever I'm saying. <laughs> like what I'm doing is, you know, providing the context, what's at stake here, where they came from um, and how close they are to winning and you know, some background stuff, but anything analytical, and uh, he, he can tell the story, knows their background. So um, Sean O'Neill, somebody who is one of the best in the sport in the United States. Uh, and you'll learn a lot from just listening to him for two minutes when you're, you can't turn away. Like that's yeah. the fun part about the sport is that I feel like not many people want to go into an Olympic say, oh, I'm really interested in seeing what happens at table tennis. <laughs> well, well, once yeah. they put it on. Right. It's hard to turn it off. It, it really becomes a viral sport every four years. Yeah. Um, it, it's something that, you know, people aren't really interested in tuning in, but once they see something go viral or once they mm -hmm. just happen to be watching, uh, it's 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 kind of one of those things you can't get your eyes off of it. Uh, one more thing about just the dynamic of the sport. Um, it's kind of similar to tennis in a way where you don't really have to be talking that much. You kind of let the point speak for itself. And it's that kind of in between where, you know, you're providing the information. How do you find the right points to really you know, pause, but also like, okay, this is a good point to, you know, tell the audience something that they didn't know. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those, you, you said it, where similar to tennis, I'm not going to talk during the point, you know, generally speaking, when that ball is going back and forth, when they're doing those crazy backhands and forehands with excellent top spin or backspin, whatever the shot is, I, I'm usually laying out and letting you see what goes on. And then at the end, 
when the uh, the point is one, come in and punctuate it and then leave room for my analysts to comment on exactly what happened, why it happened, how it happened. And then maybe I'll have time to spin it forward for the next point. But I'm doing more of that traffic cop uh, and then laying out and letting the analysts do the work uh, to explain the greatness that we just saw. And your hours are going to be a little bit easier than it was in Tokyo, right? Yes. You're not doing a total overnight. It's going to be just maybe waking up a little earlier. Yeah, it's just going to be uh, early morning. I think the uh, first matches typically start 10 a.m. local time for uh, okay. for what's going on there in Paris. So it's an early morning for, okay. for me, but it's not what I had to go through last <laughs> time, which, again, I, I signed up for it. But it was basically yeah. flipping it, and your a.m. became the p.m. and vice versa. Right. It's not that extreme, but it'll certainly take a little bit of getting used well, to it. That, that's why the commissary has all the coffee you, you ever need and want, right? Um, one last one as we wrap up here. Um, obviously, it, it's always a dream, I think, for every broadcaster to be part of an Olympic production and to be part of NBC's is, is you know, something very special. Um, when you finish up the broadcast, when you finish up these Olympics, you know, and you listen to the montage, you watch the montage, and, and you see – one table tennis highlight pop up and 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 your voice is the soundtrack for it. I mean, how does that feel to just be a part of something that's really special to be part of something that, you know, only happens once every four years? Yeah, it just goes to, it's such a great team that NBC has and it's such a machine and what they do and that you're just a small cog in what they do. Uh, you just feel satisfied when you get through your part and, one, it didn't fall apart because of you, right? Like, I don't know how great it was uh, necessarily at the end. Uh, you, it's always hard to judge your work, especially when you're in the middle of it. But uh, the fact is, like, you know, you get through it, you get to the end, and, like, nobody yanked you off the air or anything like that, right? Like, uh, you got through the end, and you provided some content, and uh, you're you're proud of yourself in that way. And, um, you know, it was similar to you. I grew up watching it on TV, and just admiring the work of not just the the athletes competing, but you know the people on air and the people you know behind the scenes that you were aware of at the time, but you didn't necessarily see. But now that you know you're in it and you get to see them, you just appreciate it even more. So the appreciation is probably the right word. Well, Chris, I'm sure you're going to do a great job, as you always do. We're looking forward to hearing you on the call of table tennis at the Paris Olympics, which uh, for those watching, uh, remember, you can watch it right here on NBC4. Opening ceremony starts July 26th. Uh, Chris, as always, appreciate it, man. Best of luck to you on the call this year. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.